I'll get to that. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to start my series of lectures on the Calk Proof Assistant. Uh, I put a URL up here. I, I can tell several people have gone there because they've asked if there's a problem that there's nothing there. In fact, that is precisely the specification for this point in time. And files will pop up there after the lectures containing the code that I showed in that lecture. So uh, a little bit of background about me. I was actually at OPLSS as a student in summer of 2004. So it's, a, it's great to be back. At, at that time, I was just getting started using the Calk Proof Assistant. And of course, I'll tell you more about what Calk is. There, w there weren't many resources about Calk at that point. Uh, there weren't any books or anything. So uh, I'm glad to have the chance to contribute to providing more educational materials and an introduction to Calk in this setting. And hopefully, you'll find uses for it in uh, various different kinds of research projects and maybe even practical stuff. I also wanted to mention, in the context of this summer school, uh, applications of type theory and so forth, uh, one of the other hats that I wear besides using Calk to do formal proofs is designing and implementing a programming language called Urweb, which is a domain-specific language for web applications that is actually based on dependent type theory. It powers web applications that together have thousands of users. By some halfway reasonable measures, it's the highest performance web framework today. So if you want to uh, get more information on that, visit my web page, which is easy to find as long as you know how to spell my last name, which is close to a globally unique identifier. <laughs> and, it, 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 and that's also my, a, a prefix of the URL written there is my home page. So yeah, so let me say a bit more about what is Calk. Uh, Peter already explained a, a bit about this, saying that you might want to use the Agda system for programming. And you might want to use the Cox system for proving large theorems. I, th I think that's a pretty good summary. And let me draw a picture that sort of expresses the big idea of how Cox works. So I should say that in contrast, especially to the lectures from earlier this week, I'm really going to be presenting a kind of engineering perspective instead of a kind of scientific or mathematical perspective here. I'm going to talk about how to build things in ways that give you confidence about them. And Bob Harper mentioned that he saw a kind of failure mode in past years of this summer school where people were proving all these theorems, and they didn't know quite how it worked. But the proof assistant accepted the results. For me, that is a great outcome. <laughs> <laughs> Under, understanding is an expense that you want to avoid wherever possible when you're building something, right? So I'm not going to talk about foundational type theories. I'm going to write some programs and write down some proofs. And if the proof assistant gives us the thumbs up, we can be happy. And then after the summer school, if you want to look into some of the theoretical details or do some sort of on-the-fly isomorphism process between what I'm doing and what happens in the other lectures, then I think that's a very useful thing to do. But given six lectures, I'm going to focus on the pragmatics of sort of design and implementation of verified software. So what exactly is Calk? What does it help you do? So at the center, there's a type theory called Galena. So, so Calk is named after the French word for rooster, and Galena is hen in, in French. So hence this connection. The type theory at the core of Calk is Galena. And there is a type checker. which is going to tell you whether your program's type check. And via the curry howard morphism, the correctness or convincingness of a proof is identified with the fact that a certain term type checks. So this type checker is the most important piece that tells us when an argument is convincing. And then we're going to do some programming with a convenient surface syntax that has some extra features like, for instance, implicit arguments along the lines of what Peter showed us. That's not part of the core type theory. It gets kind of desugared into the core type theory via type inference and other more basic syntax expansion kind of stuff. And so in this surface syntax, we'll be able to write down what we're trying to prove. So we have some theorem statements here. 
And then there are all sorts of different ways we can actually prove the theorem statement. So we're, we're going to have all sorts of different proof tools, which can actually be implemented in all sorts of different programming languages, follow all sorts of different strategies. Yes? OK, uh, this, is, this might be a little dangerous. Let's live on the, the wild side and lift the screen for now. Sure. Right. So we have all these different things. These are programs that know how to build terms in this type theory. So the sort of human input coming in on this side, driving these different tools, which are live in, in an ecosystem that it, its center is producing terms in this one type theory, the global standard of meaning in Koch uh, proofs. And the most important one of these boxes is what I'll call the, the tactic engine. We have a, a language called LTAC, which is basically a, a language for writing proofs in a kind of style that transforms one thing you want to prove into some other things that you want to prove, which imply the original thing. And so what we do is we write what's called a proof script, which feeds into the tactic engine. And the proof script can also orchestrate calling other proof tools like SMT solvers or whatever else that have been instrumented to produce these, these terms in the type theory in the end. So one of the most important things about this picture is how we can draw a kind of a boundary between these regions. Essentially, you can draw a box that excludes all those details of how we come up with the proofs. And so then this region here We have the part of the system we have to trust to believe that when we think we've proved a theorem, we have actually proved it. We need to, of course, trust the definition of the type theory itself and the code that checks the, the terms. We need to somehow believe enough about this process that goes from surface syntax into the type theory. And we need to believe that we, we stated our theorems correctly. But there's this whole other world of arbitrary complexity in actually constructing these proof terms where mistakes there should not be able to get us to accept a theorem that is not actually true. Because all of this complex reasoning machinery here produces output to justify its decisions in terms of this small type theory, which is roughly on par with what we've seen uh, for Agda and some of the, the stuff that Bob Harper presented. So in contrast to, say, a usual story of building a program with many la different languages and tools where a bug in any one of those languages can make your program crash and burn, in Calk we have this nice abstraction boundary where bugs in your proof process cannot cause you to incorrectly accept a, a false result. So in that sense, this is sort of justifying why it's not scary that things can work out as Bob mentioned where you've proved a big theorem and you're not quite sure how it worked, that's OK because you're over here and the trusted part is over here. You're, it's important to get the theorem statement right, but the proof is outside of the so-called trusted base to use uh, security terminology. Any questions about this part before I start showing you some code? OK. So really, the, the agenda that I'm going to try to support, I'll show you some of the, the basic tools that can lead up to the point of being able to, for instance, verify functional correctness properties of some system that includes, uh, actually, I'll start the screen going down while I talk. You, you have some system that includes some hardware and an operating system, and you're using a compiler, and you have some application, and it's all connected together. Calk actually makes it possible to prove a deep property about this whole system, establishing independent results about the different parts. And you can then link those results together to get one property about the whole system. And you don't have to trust anything about the proof tools that were used for any of these pieces. You can use different tools for the hardware and the application, for instance. And yet you can interface the, the theorems you've proved with a, a pretty small amount of 
of trusted code, just the code that checks these, these proof terms in the end. So uh, most important question, how do we feel about this font size? Is this, is this good? There's always a trade-off between being able to fit enough stuff and making individual characters more readable. Dark background. <laughs> I see. I think that might be more, uh, that might take long enough to be counterproductive right now, but um, maybe for the future ones I could prepare for that. Slightly bigger. Slightly bigger, okay. In that case, let's, uh, anyone have a favorite Emacs uh, font size that would be perfect here? I can start with this one that I sometimes use. We'll see how that goes. <coughs> Okay. Uh, but then it doesn't get saved across both opening and closing. <laughs> All right, so let me start off by just doing some programming so we can ground this in something really concrete. I'm going to, st so first uh, I'm in Emacs and I'm using uh, an Emacs mode called Proof General. There's also a, a standalone Calc IDE that some people like to use. I have minimal experience with it myself. I prefer to stick with Emacs. And uh, another important point, my recommended mode of participating in these lectures is not to try to follow along typing these things in your own personal Cox system, though that might be a good deal for some people. I'm going to try to do this interactively, so I will be your IDE and you can have that experience without having this loaded on your, your laptop. And then we'll have the hands-on session, uh, a few of them about Cox, and that will be the opportunity to actually do the, the typing yourself. So I'll be, I'll be asking for audience participation here, uh, trusting each person to judge whether their level of familiarity with Calc is such that they'll get the answers too quickly and it's not worth coming in when I ask for advice about what to do at each point. I'm hoping we can kind of learn together about the right way to, to drive this kind of tool. And yeah, like I said, this code will appear at that URL at after this lecture is finished and so on for each of the future lectures. All right, so the basic mode is a little different from the one we saw with, with Agda. We're going to basically move the cursor to some point and then say, I want Calc to run to that point also. And then the, the background changes to this different highlighting to indicate that this content has been processed. All the later content that's not highlighted has not been processed and for all we know, it could be full of typos. Uh, probably not true in this case, but we can proceed very incrementally here. And uh, here's an example of a comment. Cock is happy with the comment. It's a good start. So uh, here's a, an example of an inductive type definition which corresponds to an algebraic data type definition in, say, ML or Haskell. We're saying I'm introducing a new type called exp, or exp for expression, and it's a set. Here set means the same thing. It's meant in several contexts in other lectures. And there are three constructors for building expressions. We have one called constant that takes a natural number, written as nat, and produces an expression. So let me actually write up on the board a grammar for this, just so it's completely clear what we're talking about. This is basically saying, An expression is a number or an addition of two expressions or multiplication of two expressions and the numbers are drawn from the natural numbers. So we get the, those binary operators by having a constructor like plus that is written as taking two expressions as inputs and here the the fact of having two different arguments is written in a, a curried style like you see in many functional programming languages. <coughs> so let's process that. Uh, I didn't say it yet. It <laughs> happens to be control C, control enter. But uh, yeah, with the interface you're using, the key combination is asking me to, to m move the point forward. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have a definition of a type. And now we might want to define an operation on that type. Here's one called eval that is going to take an expression and 
evaluate it to produce a number. So we write the keyword fixed point for a recursive function. And we give a type for the argument. And the, here's the return type. We use a pattern matching construct, which is very similar to the ones in ML or Haskell. We check to see what kind of expression we're working with. If it's a constant, we just pull out the number n, that is the argument, and we return that. If it's a plus, we get two sub-expressions, e1 and e2. We should evaluate those and add them together. And if it's a time, as we do the same thing, where I write a star instead of a plus. You can use Unicode in Coq, but I'm not going to be doing it. So we have an asterisk instead of anything fancier. Sorry. But this is an evaluation function. Yes, in the back. Yes, I'm using standard library definitions of arithmetic on natural numbers here. In a few moments, we'll go back and reconstruct that stuff from more first principles. Yeah. There are. All the functions need to terminate. <laughs> and I won't go into too much detail about that here. I will, by purest coincidence, write only definitions that Koch accepts as terminating. Uh, the conditions are pretty straightforward, but there are some twists. If you happen to know the, the keywords primitive recursion, that's basically what it is, but it means something less primitive than in other contexts. Were there any other questions? Yeah. Right. Right. OK, well, let's go on. And I have one more function here, the kind of thing you only write when you're looking for an example of a theorem to prove. What if we switch the order of all the operators, of all the operands to the operators? I'm glad you asked. Here's how we would do it. And we will prove that this preserves the meanings of the operators. This is a recursive function that goes from expressions to expressions. It leaves constants alone. It maps any constant to itself. For a plus, it commutes all the arguments within the two operands and then switches the order. So we're recursively switching the order of all the operands throughout the whole expression tree. And this also is a well-founded definition. But before I prove something about that, I wanted to back up to something more basic and sort of uh, building on a question that was asked. The operators like times, in contrast to most programming languages, are not built into Coq. They are defined from first principles using more basic concepts in type theory. So let's go back and start defining the natural numbers. And actually, before I do that, in case you're wondering about this funny split into three different panels in my Emacs window, this panel in the middle is just completely wasting space now because we haven't proved any theorems yet. Good stuff will pop up there when we do. Down at the bottom, we're getting this constant feedback from the Cox system, like you asked me to define that, and I did it. That also will be more interesting if there are mistakes in the programs. And I'm sure some of those will come up sooner or later. OK. So here's a definition of the natural numbers. I'm using, I've sort of alpha varied it to use different versions of identifiers that are intentionally not what appear in the standard library, just to avoid confusing name clashes for this presentation, because I'll go back to the standard library version afterward by just using the normal names instead of the strange names here. So this is an inductive definition of the natural numbers. And let me write this out in more of inference rule notation. So this, this definition says, basically, we have one inference rule that says 0 is a natural number, and another one that says we have this function uh, SUCC that stands for successor, or plus 1. So if we have some natural number n, then its successor is also a natural number. It's kind of the most basic inductive definition that is not trivially recursive. It's a definition of a type in terms of itself. And it happens to correspond to our usual intuitive idea of the natural numbers. We can write any number. We have any number k is really just encoded as the repeated application of the successor function k times to the, the 0 constructor. So that's the isomorphism with our usual uh, 
grade school idea of what are natural numbers. But to test that this is a useful definition, we might want to reconstruct more of the grade school operations, like we might want to add two numbers together. So here's a recursive definition of add. I guess this is along the lines of what Bob showed in an earlier lecture, just with different syntax, where you have two natural numbers, n and m, and we're going to produce another natural number as a result. And so we check. As in his example, we can sort of do recursion on the first argument or the second one. I'm going to do the first one here because that happens to be the convention in, in Calk at least. So if we're adding 0 to any number, that has no effect. We just return that number m. And if we're adding the successor of some number n prime, we just return the successor of the result of adding n prime to m. And this turns out to exactly mirror our usual idea of addition on the natural numbers. All right, so now we're going to want to prove some theorems. And to do that, we'll need induction. And the natural numbers are a good starting example for the general concept of induction in Calk because we all know the usual mathematical induction principle. I want to show how we can derive that principle using some general rules that takes any inductive type definition and produces its induction principle. So the way that works is. We want an induction principle to show that for all n in the natural numbers, some predicate holds of n. And to do that, we'll have some proof obligations. And we can read those obligations off of the inference rules that we use to define the original type itself. So let me, I'll erase this part because it's not directly related. What we'll do is everywhere that we said, we had a rule that concluded some value belongs to nat. I'll just sort of scratch that out. And I'll replace the conclusion of each rule with showing that our chosen predicate p applies to that value. And then I'll add an extra premise to this one rule that includes uh, a recursive mention of the same type. And I'll say also that p holds of n. So I've taken these inference rules and I've turned them into specifications of what you, the person invoking induction, need to prove to come up with the conclusion that you're looking for. And so the rule is, if you'd like to show that some predicate p holds for all n, show that it holds for 0, and then show that it holds for the successor of a number, assuming that it holds for that number itself. So this is a general recipe, and we'll see a few more examples of taking an inductive definition and deriving a sound induction principle that we can use to prove properties of it. So let's put that to work here. Let's try to prove that addition is associative. So I've used a command called theorem, which lets us state a logical property. And every theorem has a name. Here's the name for this one. And we have a for all quantification over three natural numbers, n, m, and o. And then I have these, an equality between two terms that have different ways of associating the addition, where we somehow by the end have n, m, and o all added together. And I have this command here that I haven't actually run here called admitted, which is what you can put in a cock development when you're not ready to prove something yet. It just basically assumes it as an axiom. But we don't need to do that here. We'll be proving this theorem. So we can write proof instead. It's kind of a syntactic marker that doesn't really have much of an effect, but can make these things easier to read. And we would like to prove that these two addition terms lead to the same result. So if you were going to do this in the classic informal way, how would you start this proof? Any ideas? Yeah, so induction on n is a good choice. And we can more or less literally write that here. We can, th this is our first example of what's called a tactic. It's a program in this language, LTAC, which is a domain-specific language for constructing proofs in a way that every operation knows how to build a, a term in the type theory that justifies the decision. And indeed, though I won't go into the details here, this theorem statement here is really just a, a particular dependent type. This for all is really a a pi type or a dependent function type, uh, the tactics will hide those details from us. They will do the work that you did in solving the exercises that Bob assigned. 
That is all built into particular tactics with names that are closer to standard mathematical practice. Was there a question back there? Yeah. That's right, yeah. You have to audit the way you've written your theorem statements. You have to audit commands like the one used here to begin the proof to make sure you proved what you meant to prove. All the details bracketed between the keyword proof and another one we'll see called QED. Those are, you don't have to worry about making mistakes there because they generate proof terms that are, that are checked by this, this type checker here. Yeah. Well, you mean the general induction principle? It, so this, this is one of those, uh, like giving a, a demo for high school kids about something dangerous. You show them something so scary, they never want to do it again. Uh, I'm going to show you the, the induction, induction principle for natural numbers. In general, it's the name of the type, underscore IND is the name of the term. That's defined at the moment you write the inductive definition. So you can print that and, oh, it's just defined as a synonym for another more general thing. So this isn't nearly as scary as I was thinking, but let me put the more general thing here. And it's not going to be too bad either. It's a recursive definition using dependent types in a way that I don't want to dwell on too much here. But this is induction for the natural numbers. <laughs> sure. All right, but. It isn't, no. Induction is something you only mention in proofs, and the proofs are all checked from first principles. This induction principle is deriving induction from first principles for the particular type in question. Okay. Yes? So I'm, so I'm redefining natural numbers from scratch here, not using the standard library, and therefore none of the built-in automation support applies here directly. All right, I probably checked the wrong definition instead of my own one. So uh, really, this should look pretty similar. This is the principle for the one I just defined. It's the same one, modulo alpha renaming. All right, let me make that go away. All right, so we say this is, will be a proof by induction on n. We're referencing one of the variables that appears in this for all list. And then we have two sub goals. Uh, here we see, so, so this central pane is now active showing us what we need to prove. In general, we'll have a double line here, sort of similar to that line that you're used to in an inference rule. And under the line is something we need to prove. And above it, in general, will be assumptions, things that we're allowed to assume in that proof. So the most, uh, one of the most frequently used tactics or proof steps is one called intros based on the concept of an introduction rule that is going to, in this case, take these two variables that are for all quantified here and turn them into free variables that appear above this double line. So now we have M and O available as natural numbers and we need to prove this fact. It turns out a useful thing to do here is simplify according to the definition of add. Apply the definition of add to reduce this as much as possible. That's what a tactic called simple does, standing for algebraic simplification. So I'll run that. And now, this doesn't look too hard. Uh, anyone who is not already familiar with Calc have a guess what we might want to write on this line? Yeah, very close, reflexivity. Whenever we get to the point where we're trying to show that something equals itself, then reflexivity is a tactic that will establish that. Okay, so we just did the base case of our inductive proof. And now there's just one sub-goal left, as this says. And we are trying to show that the theorem holds where we've taken all the places n appeared and we put it in successor of n instead at this spot and this spot. And we have an inductive hypothesis that tells us the theorem holds for n, which is the value one lower than the value that we're focusing on here. So let me use intros to bring some of those variables above the line. And then let's simplify again. And we get to this form. So given what we, we have available in the, in the assumptions above the line here, do we have any suggestions about a good way to 
finish this proof? Yeah. Right, we want to use the inductive hypothesis. We, in general, there are some choices about different ways of using an inductive hypothesis. In this case, a useful one is called rewriting, where we have some equation here. We want to find an instance of the left-hand side of the equation in our goal somewhere, and then replace it with the right-hand side of the equation. And we happen to have, right here, a match for the left-hand side of the equation. So let's use that and replace it using the induction hypothesis with what we find on the right-hand side up here. So I'll write rewrite IHN. So all of our assumptions have names. We usually call them hypotheses. And they, the induction hypotheses tend to have names starting with IH. This is built-in behavior of the induction tactic. So when we do that, we're in good shape because now the two sides of this equation are literally equal. And we can write reflexivity. And finally, I'm going to type QED, which actually triggers the construction of a term in the, the core type theory. And it gets independently checked so that if there were any bugs in the, in the code implementing these higher level steps, we'll catch them for sure at this point. And that is our proof. Let me see if I can just make this all go on screen at once. Yep. OK, so here's our first cock proof. Yeah? Are the um, generated by, uh, is all of that in the text language? Is that the kind of the heads up display that you get as part of the LPAC, or is that trusted? It's definitely not trusted. It's the, the core type checker has nothing to do with that human oriented display. Yeah? If you do it at the very beginning once, if I added an extra intros here, then you'd get this behavior, which is counterintuitive to many uh, new cock users, in that the induction hypothesis would no longer quantify universally over M and O. They would be fixed for the course of the proof, which, I th which probably works fine for this proof. For others, it would be too weak of an induction hypothesis, and you'd then have to go back and strengthen it in the way that we're used to from proofs on paper to include more universal quantifiers instead of treating values as constants. Sure. Yep, I can explain it. So we're, we're trying to prove this formula that starts with for all quantifiers. Yeah. And when I run intros, these variables are going to change into free variables instead of being explicitly quantified. It's always the for alls uh, for, for the subset of the behavior that I've presented so far. It'll also work for implications. Left-hand sides of implications will turn into new premises, new assumptions available to you. All right. OK, let's try something a little more ambitious, though it's not obvious it's more ambitious by looking at it. Let's prove that addition is commutative. <coughs> and you can probably guess induction on n is not a bad idea here. And let me show you a little shortcut that I'll use a lot. Uh, we can, if we're going to run intros in every one of the subgoals that's generated, we might as well write it once. And we use a semicolon to say, run this tactic. It will produce a number of subgoals. Then run this one on every one of those subgoals. So now we have intros automatically run here. And we have two subgoals showing that zero, adding zero commutes in the right way and adding a successor commutes in the right way. In this first one, I can run simplification like before. And actually, let me do that in both of them. I'll run intros and simple in each case. And now we're trying to show that some number is equal to adding itself to 0. And out to be something we won't be able to make too much progress on directly unless we do a nested induction. But we actually want to prove this as a separate lemma. So let me back up and do that. There's, a, this, there's this lemma command, which is basically a synonym for theorem, but it signifies something different to the person reading the code. So if we, if we do add 0, a useful lemma is basically exactly the fact we were stuck on. If you add a number to 0, you get back the same number. And I think, I think Bob gave this example in his earlier lectures. It's surprising this, this fact does not follow directly, whereas if I swap the arguments, it does follow directly. 
And that's because we defined addition by pattern matching on the first argument. If we did it with pattern matching on the second argument, this fact would follow immediately from calculation. But because of the way we defined addition, we have to do some extra work here. And we can just do induction on n. Actually, let me simplify in both cases. First case, uh, I think that's safe to assume it's true. And then in the second case, we can rewrite with our induction hypothesis to find an add n0 right here, replace it with an n. And now, that's pretty obviously true. OK, so we have a lemma that we proved just in service of establishing some other fact. We can now go back to the proof of the other one and use this lemma. Yeah? Yeah, there, there's syntax for doing that. I don't generally use it myself because we'll get to more automated proofs that avoid this issue. So, so it's completely well determined at each point which sub-goal you're working on just by the semantics of the tactics that came before. And in general, you, don't, you would rather not write any of these lines and have it all be done automatically. And I'll get to that by the end of this lecture. Oh, yes. Sorry, I, I uh, should have said that explicitly. There's this sim every tactic takes a goal and transforms it into zero or more others. And if it's zero, then you move on to the next one that you had queued up. There is nesting. Exactly how it works follows from the semantics of all the tactics. Uh, short answer is you get used to it. <laughs> okay, so let's use this lemma that we just proved. Let's rewrite with add zero. And now reflexivity does the job. That's good. And then we're faced with this goal where we can rewrite using the induction hypothesis. And we're still not quite done. We have that we're, we have the successor of this addition we want to show it's equal to the result of adding the successor directly to the, the first number. So any guesses about a good lemma to prove to handle this case? We can. You mean starting from from here? So we have this equation here, and we're just applying it to find a match for the left-hand side, which is here, and replace it with the right-hand side, which just swaps the order of the arguments. So we can basically take the dual of the lemma we proved before to finish this. In fact, I will even copy and paste this and change it up a bit. Let's add a successor and show that this is equal to pulling the successor out to the front. And let's proceed. Let's, let's try to reuse the proof script from before to the extent that we can. Actually, I'll put intros in now that we have an extra variable. First case, successor of something equals itself. That's good. Second case. You're right with the induction hypothesis, reflexivity, good. OK, so this is an example of the video game style of proof. Uh, <laughs> apparently, this theorem is true for the same reason as the other, so why would we want to bother understanding it since we already understood the other one? So now, this is where we were stuck before. Let's rewrite using the add successor lemma. And now, reflexivity finishes the job. And instead of admitted, we can say QED because we were successful. I can make it print the type down here. Is that, were you looking for the, the, the theorem statement? Yeah, here it is. OK. Any more questions before we go back to the first example that I said we needed some practice with natural numbers before we were ready to go back to the program transformation example? 
Okay. Good question. In terms of terminology, uh, what things do we call tactics? Like, is rewrite a tactic as well? Yes. Okay. So all the things in there are tactics, including activities? Every one of these units of stuff with a period after is a tactic. Okay. Uh, each one is an instruction for how to transform one sub-goal into zero or more sub-goals. Yeah. Well, so, so th this is the theorem statement at the bottom here. Is that what you meant? Yes. OK. Yeah, there are all these, these nice little commands for looking up types and theorem statements in, in Emacs that I'm, I'm not going to speak the, the uh, key combinations out loud, but you can find them in the help mode and are asking me during the hands-on session. Yeah? Is the proof basically on our tactic? Is the proof? You mean this whole thing between proof and QED? Yeah. I w we wouldn't call that a tactic. It's, yeah, we'd call it a proof. <laughs> because it's not something you invoke again in the same way. I yeah. guess kind of my question is, presumably there's some way of constructing new tactics from a sequence of... Yes, models. and I will show an example by the end of this lecture. All right, so let's go back to these expressions. And I'll, I'll zoom back up to this definition we started with. And let me rewrite this definition as inference rules so that we can in a systematic way derive the induction principle that we get for it. This is really just a review of structural induction, which depending on where you, you first learned about discrete math and logic may or may not be uh, a, something you're used to working with. So let's define a few rules here. So this rule says by the way, I'm going back to the natural numbers from the standard library, so I'm writing nat instead of natural. So we can reuse all the standard library stuff, like multiplication, which I didn't define uh, from scratch yet. If we have an, a number, then you can apply the constant constructor to the number, and you get an expression. And If you have two expressions, then you can apply plus to them, and you get a new expression. And finally, <coughs> same rule, but we write times instead of plus. So these are the three rules that define how to build expressions in this language. So now we are going to transform this into an induction principle. We're trying to show that for all expressions, some predicate P holds. For those of you who are getting clipped here, off the end here it says P V. <laughs> and the way we do that is we take all these places that said we're concluding an that some term is an expression, let's forget about those, and change all the, the conclusions to the predicate P that we care about <coughs> holds. And let's find all of the premises that say something is an expression. And for every one of those, let's add an extra premise saying that the predicate P holds of that thing. And now we have derived the induction principle. So again, we've sort of reversed the senses of this notation compared to where we started from. These are now, each of these rules tells you something you as the user need to prove when you, you invoke induction. You need to choose this predicate P, and you need to prove each of these implications. So this is the structural induction principle for expressions, and we can use it to prove theorems like the correctness of this funny definition. So here's our regular eval function, which just is the calculator that takes an expression and computes a number. And then there's this, this one I said you'd only write if you wanted an example of how to prove a theorem by structural induction, the commuter that reverses the orders of all the operands throughout the full expression tree of an expression. So we're going to use that structural induction principle to prove that this commuter function preserves the meanings of expressions up to our definition of evaluation. So let's see what that means as a theorem statement, in case that helps clear it up. I just use the key combination to move back to the frontier. That's another useful one, which I'll, I'll, I might write on the board for hands-on purposes later. OK, so let's prove properties of expressions. Here's our theorem statement. 
If you run commuter on an expression and then evaluate, that's the same as just evaluating in the first place. So hopefully that's a pretty intuitive correctness condition and it makes sense why we'd like to show this. So instead of admitting that as an axiom, let's actually prove it. And we can just write induction on E because induction, the induction tactic works for any inductive definition. It's not something special for the natural numbers. It, it knows which induction principle to use by examining the type of the variable that you've chosen. So here we've chosen E. So we should get three cases because I've written three rules up there. For instance, we have the original goal where E has been replaced with constant N. So we need to show this property holds for any constant. Let me run simplification in every case now to, so we see exactly we'll look after we apply the definitions of these functions. So this first one looks okay. We just directly get by computation that the two sides are equal when we're working with a constant. Things are a little more complicated when we're working with plus. So we have two induction hypotheses which correspond to P of E1 and P of E2 in this rule. And those are IHE1 and IHE2. Each of them tells us the theorem holds for one of the sub-expressions, E1 or E2. And we need to conclude the theorem for the whole original plus expression. And all these, we've done some partial evaluation to get the actual natural number to appear on both sides, but the two sides don't quite match. So do we have any suggestions about how we can get them to match, given what is on screen? We can use rewrite. We can write rewrite with our two inductive hypotheses. So that'll say, I'm looking for an eval commuter E1. Have you seen one? Well, yes, it's right here. So we'll replace it with this. And likewise, we're looking for an eval commuter E2, which is right here. We'll replace it with this. And now we have the same thing modulo commutativity of addition. Uh, we switch to using the standard library version of natural numbers. We don't need to prove everything ourselves. We can just note that I think what I do here is say this theorem follows from the algebraic properties of semi-rings, which the natural numbers with plus and times happen to be a semi-ring. And now that one's proved. And in the spirit of thinking as little as possible, let's try the same thing again. We get basically the same goal, except now it says times instead of plus. Don't worry, times also needs to be commutative for semi-rings, so that gets proved too. And finally, we build a proof term, run the proof checker on it, cock is satisfied, so this is indeed a true fact. Any questions about that proof? So in this case, could you not put the rewrite in the ring as semicolon after you press the Would that work? Yes, that would definitely have worked. And let me think, is this the right time for me to go even further in that direction and show some fancy stuff. Yeah, why not? So, so let's make this proof shorter and sort of prepare it for a future where we might add a new kind of constructor to our expression type. And we might even hope this proof keeps working. So one way of doing that is I'm going to do the following thing. I'm going to say, after you simplify, inspect the form of the proof goal. Here I'm using some of the features of LTAC that are, are relatively underused. Uh, it's a domain-specific Turing-complete language for inspecting proof states. And so I'm going to look at the goal and, and check and see, do I have some hypothesis H? Here H is a binder. It, it will match an arbitrary hypothesis. Is there some hypothesis that establishes some equality? I don't really care what it is. And I'm proving something. Let's rewrite with that. Why the human doesn't need to figure that out. I can just try all the possibilities. So in, in general, I'm not going to go into too much detail on these scripting features. This is meant to be more of an advertisement for something you might want to look into during the hands-on session or later. But you can notice that the rewrites we did were performed automatically. Instead of giving the specific rewrites, we gave a general rule that helps the system find the correct rewrites. So now all that's left to do in each of these cases is apply those ring axioms automatically via ring. And so I can just chain ring on the end here. And now it's proved. So we could add all sorts of other operators in here. And, and there's a good chance this proof would keep working, which is important for scaling a result like this to a large
code base that you'd like to verify and that you might want to evolve over time while maintaining your proofs alongside the code. Yeah? Yeah, it's a commutative semi-ring. Uh, okay, so I should have said that. Sorry. <laughs> yes. So what happens with the trivial case here that was introduced by Stevens? It happens to follow by ring also because reflexivity is true in any theory. So it's also true in the ring theory. Yeah. You can write a little right arrow, and that goes the other way, and it ha happens to still be a true, a correct proof in this case to go the other way. <laughs> so that, that, that takes, finds all occurrences of the right-hand side to replace with occurrences of the, the left-hand side. So this is how no current philosophy should apply, so what's uh, The semantics of repeat is that if there's nothing you do, then it stops. Yeah. Ah, this is, I'm assuming that from the earlier lectures, you'll recognize this guy immediately. Maybe not. The turnstile, the, it, re, read it as proves or something like that. Right. But again, I'm not trying to, to really convey the details of this scripting language for building proof procedures. I'll just be demonstrating these as an advertisement for this uh, aspect of using caulk that is worth looking into after the, the summer school. Yeah. With a capital R? Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, cap you, you need both a rith and ring, but that'll, that'll, that's in the source file that I'll post afterward. All right. Any more questions? Uh, yes? Yeah, it's, it's less of a variable than just a. Think of match goal as one combined piece of syntax that says inspect the current proof state. Um, let's look at one more example, which has to do with lambda terms and proving properties of operations on lambda terms. So I can, one of the happiest moments is always deleting your old manual proof script once the automation works. So. I'm glad we get to share this moment. There we go. So here's a definition of the syntax of lambda calculus terms. And I'll just write it. I guess we, this is very close to the, the logical framework definition that we saw earlier in Peter's lectures, but I'll just write it up here for completeness. So that inductive definition is essentially saying an expression is a variable or a lambda abstraction or an application, which we can also rewrite using inference rules. So let me do that so that we can apply our recipe for getting induction principles. By the way, x is an element of the set of strings. It doesn't really matter what we pick, we can, but this is sort of the human-friendly version of what the syntax of lambda calculus is. We could use numbers or any countably infinite set there. So if x is a string, then variable of x is an expression. And also, if x is a string and e is an expression, then The lambda abstraction of x over e is an expression. And finally, if we have two expressions, we can apply one to the other. And we get a new expression. So this is the syntax of lambda terms. I hope that makes sense. So if we want an induction principle, uh, did I mix up the names there? 
Oh yeah, right. I called them terms here to avoid clashing with, with the other definition I made. So I'll switch that. Thank you. All right, so our, an induction principle is going to give us a way to conclude that for every term e, some predicate p holds e. So given the recipe from before, any suggestions for how I'm going to change these rules to get the obligations on the user of induction when we do structural induction on a lambda term? Right, at least in the, in the bottoms of the rules, I'm going to cross out the fact that we're just concluding a typing fact, and then we'll change those so that they're still type correct. They're still making a, lot, a mathematical assertion. What, what did we change there? Yeah, we, we, now we're just going to be showing that the predicate we care about holds of every one of these schematic terms. And then one more broad kind of change we have to make. Yeah, and every one of these premises where we, can, we assume that some term, that something is a term, will add an extra premise where we assume that the predicate P holds of it. Okay, so this is the structural induction principle for lambda terms, at least in terms of how we've defined them here. And uh, also, by the way, Cock is happy with that definition. That's convenient. This is too big. And now here's a definition of substitution for lambda terms, which is a simple one that only works for substituting a closed term inside of another one. Let me just write this in more standard syntax. So what it means is, So this is the standard syntax that we've seen in earlier lectures of substituting a, value, a, a term rep for a variable x inside of e. I'll just write that as a regular function here. We apply subs to the arguments. First, the term that we're plugging in. Second, the variable we're looking for. And third, the, the term that we're doing the searching inside of. String is from the standard library also, yeah. So the main standard library modules I'm using here are nat for the earlier examples and string for this example. All that really matters is it's some countably infinite type with an equality test function, which I'm using here, the equality test function. It actually has a fairly complicated type. It's a dependent type. I won't go into the details here. It'll all just kind of work out for us without thinking too hard about what it means. And, uh, but think, read this as a double equals or whatever kind of equality test you're used to seeing. So the definition of substitution, if you're substituting in a variable, check if that variable equals the one that you're looking for. If it is, then drop in the replacement. Otherwise, keep the term the same. If you're substituting inside a lambda abstraction, it'll still be an abstraction afterwards. And you check if the variable you're substituting for equals the one that's being bound. If so, then you sort of block the substitution and you keep the same body from before. Otherwise, you recursively make the same substitution inside the body. And then the app is, is probably the easiest case. You just recursively push substitution through the two arguments to app. So this implicit equality test. Mm -hmm. oh, I see, just by writing patterns, so-called nonlinear patterns that mention the same variable multiple times. Mm, not as far as I'm aware of in, in Galena. L LTAC, the tactic language, allows that, but not Galena, because it's a little hard to see how to do that nicely in, in type theory. And all this is getting desugared into a core calculus, where the terms should look pretty similar to what the user writes, so it's easier to think about in doing proofs. Right, so this is our standard definition of substitution. The details aren't too important for what's going to follow. Here's another standard definition that expresses when a variable x is not free in a term e. 
meaning either that variable does not appear at all, or it only appears under lambdas that are binding the same variable. So we can find this recursively. I'm using a new type, capital P prop, which is the type of mathematical propositions. It's a lot like Boolean in some senses, but it's a, it's a constructive version, and probably you've gotten some idea what that means from the earlier lectures, but it's also completely fine to sort of read this as bool that has its own funny operators like this instead of the usual or operator, and this instead of the usual and operator. <laughs> so definition of not free in, if we're checking whether x is free in the variable y, isn't it, sorry, is not free in the variable y, that's true exactly when y is different. And an application is, again, the simplest case, where we just run the not free in check the same way on both sides of the application. So there's that one. <coughs> so here's a theorem we might want to prove. Let me space this out a little differently. We'd like to prove that substitution is commutative in an appropriate sense. I'm going to run two substitution operations with these. We're, we're replacing variables x and x1 and x2 with terms rep1 and rep2, respectively. And I've switched the order of the substitution operations between these two sides of the equality. So I'll just write this in a more standard notation. Something like do these substitutions in those two different orders, then we'd like to be sure that we get the same result. And of course, there are some important side conditions for that to be true. One of them here is that the two variables are different, and the other ones are that both of the, the terms that we're substituting, that we're plugging in for variables, actually have no variables free in them. We could have a weaker condition and have this still be true, but this is, this is sufficient to establish the result. So if, you, if you're plugging in some closed terms for two different variables, you can do the substitution in either order, and you get the same result. All right, so any guesses for a good way to start this proof? Some sort of induction that we're doing? Induction on x. Yeah, I think induction on e is going to turn out to be good. So it happens the variables x1 and x2 are strings, which do have inductive structure, though I haven't shown you the inductive definition. But probably that structure isn't too useful to consider here. And also the replacement expressions have inductive structure, but maybe intuitively you, can, you agree that we probably don't need to examine that structure for this to work, uh, at least at the top level of the proof. So let's do induction and simple and intros here. And we'll get, well, because uh, there are three rules over there, we'll get three cases. This is the case for variables, where we have these substitution results that contain inside of them these, these tests on whether some string s equals the variable x2, and a test for whether that string s equals the variable x1. So it turns out a useful thing to do here is a case analysis on how this string comparison turns out. And I'll do that with a tactic called destruct which is for doing case analysis on which constructor was used to build an expression. So you, because you're working with constructors, we're kind of doing the inverse and destructing the expression to undo the effects of the constructors and figure out where we started from. So I'll just copy this expression that appears here to do a case analysis on its value. And we'll see this if we'll get two. This sub will we'll split into two. In the first one, we'll replace this whole if with this term. And in the second one, we'll replace the whole if with this term. And we also got this extra equality added up here. And in the other case, it'll be an inequality to record which of the two branches we're in based on whether the equality test succeeded or not. Yeah? I don't think it would be a syntax error. Yeah. <laughs> this destruct isn't built to do that, but we'll get there. Uh, with a different approach. 
All right, so we, we split into two cases by examining the expression that is the result of an if test. And let's actually split it into four cases by examining the other one, too. And now what we have here is that, well, apparently, x1 is not equal to x2, s is equal to x2, and s is equal to x1. So how can we use that to prove this goal? Sorry? Yeah, so this is a contradictory situation. We, have, we can basically derive that s is not equal to itself by combining these three hypotheses. So we don't need to work too hard in this case. I'm going to call a tactic called congruence, which is a general procedure that understands the rules of equality in constructors. And so it realizes there's a contradiction here. And then in this case, this, is, this one's probably, this one's still consistent. Let's run simplification here. And uh, we get, it's basically applying the definitions of recursive functions. That's, a more, that's essentially all it does. Each recursive function definition induces a set of equations and it rewrites with those. Yeah? Th that's folded in to, th it does that too where appropriate. Sometimes you want to put the type in like this. Okay, so we have six subgoals here, as this number says. We're down to five. And I simplify this side. And we get a repeat of the same term we already destructed, which is kind of silly, but we can do that again. Now this is, useful case, I think this, this case is not contradictory, though the next one is, and what we actually need to use here is an, at least the way I, I proved it before, is to use another, another lemma. So this, this fact is true, any, any thoughts on, what fundamentally makes it true? We have the one term we're looking to plug in. Let, let, let me just read, read this more intuitively first. We have rep two is one of the terms we're trying to plug into this other term. And, and within the replacement, we're looking for all occurrences of this variable to replace with the other term we're looking to plug in. We want to know somehow this replacement operation here has no effect and we get back to the same term as before. Right. So. If we look up here, we see for all variables x, including this one, obviously, then x is not free in rep2. So substituting for x should have no effect. So we would like to prove that as a lemma. So let's do that. I'll start by copying this so we remember what we're trying to prove. And make some more space here. Let's say we're trying to substitute rep for x in E. We get back E. Given that x is not free in E. So induction by E works here again. Let's put some intros after that. Actually, let me run simple. So, that, so now that's simplifying the definition of not free in, not just the definition of subs. So in particular, this hypothesis came from a not free in fact, but it was reduced according to the definition. So now we should be able to destruct. We see we, see we have an if test here, so let's do a case analysis on how it turns out. See what we get. In this case, we have s is both not equal to and equal to x, so that's contradictory. That case goes away. And here we have a lovely little reflexivity, so that is easy. Now here we have, based on the definition of 
but not free. And we have, we have this or fact here. Either the, the string s is equal to x, which is the variable we're substituting for, and here s is the variable bound by abs, or x is not free in the body. And we can address that by using destruct. This time we're using it on the, this or hypothesis h. So an or hypothesis in dependent type theory is, is sort of like a variant type. Or, or um, another way of thinking about this is you can just use destruct on a hypothesis that establishes an or, and that splits your goal into two cases. One where you assume the left conjunct and the, or disjunct, and the other where you assume the right disjunct. So now we'll split this into two cases, one where we know s equals x, and the other where we know not free in x e, and we need to establish the goal in both cases. So first we have the s equals x case. We can do a string deck destruct in this case also. That looks true. And here's another contradictory case where we have both equal and not equal for some pair of values. And then finally, here I must need, uh, this was we, the result of another case analysis earlier. So let's just keep plugging away, doing case analysis on everything we do an if on. Again, this looks nice and true. And in this one, coincidentally, our induction hypothesis is now enabled. We, we have a term that looks like this in our goal, and we wish it looked like this. And we're allowed to do that using rewrite. This time, the equality has a condition. It's an implication that has some other fact before it. But we can see we know that fact, so we should be in good shape. I'll run rewrite. And now this follows by reflexivity. And that extra condition is left over. We just say assumption because we already have a fact around that proves that one. And we can do something very similar here. We have these two induction hypotheses that establish what we're looking for. This follows by reflexivity. And then I can run destruct on an and hypothesis to split it into two. You've probably seen similar rules in Frank's lectures about proof theory. This is the basic thing you do to get rid of an and. And now this holds by assumption. And the same thing should work in the other case. All right, so that was a pretty tedious proof, and there wasn't too much insight in it. So, yeah. Um, you did a case analysis in the, in the, let's say, the first case. Did you, did you back up to that? The R case? It's like that, yeah. Um, but you already Oops. know that S is different from X. Could you somehow rewrite it in that fact? Yes, but it's a little tricky. Okay. So, yeah, it's a, I couldn't do it on the spot here. My Emacs mode may have gotten <coughs> confused. Yeah. There, there are idioms for that. I don't use them much myself because, well, l let me show you a different way of doing this proof that avoids the need to keep that in your head. So I'm not going to explain too much of, of the details of this, but another question? Yeah? No. Well, you, you had to prove each subpart of the hypothesis. No, in both cases, you get to assume the subparts of the okay. hypothesis. Can you come back into assumption? Does it take any appropriate assumption from the list of the assumptions? Sorry, give me, give me a second here. I'm going to restart this because it gets confused sometimes. Uh, OK. I'll keep that in mind. And then where were we? We were at the first use of assumption. That's weird. Oh, because I changed something. OK. 
What's the question? Doesn't matter which one, as long as it matches exactly the goal, then okay. that's just as good a proof as any other. Yep. So can you help me with the diagram over there? When you look at the, the little propositions about the turn, I mean, I'm just a little bit lost on the structure, I guess, of what you're doing here. Like, I mean, you know, over there in the diagram, you have the sand statement part on the trusted part. So that assumes that you're, you're writing the right theorem statement. So, like, in between the theorem and the proof line, you just have to assume that you've written that correctly. Okay? And then, I guess, between the, between the, the proof and the QED, that's the, those are the tactics. Right. But where, where are the, I mean, I don't understand the problem. That's a theorem statement. It's one that's generated automatically, and it doesn't matter if it's correct, because it's not your final theorem statement. It's a, it's a lemma within a larger proof. Each one of these rules here is an implication that you must prove when you use induction. So the statement of the induction principle has each one of those rules as a premise. So how, how is that related to, I guess, a theorem? Like when you write theorem, I guess I forgot. It's been a long time. Here. Uh, This is the statement of the induction principle for expressions. For every property of terms, if you prove the first of those rules, and you prove the second of those rules, and you prove the third of those rules, then for all terms, the predicate holds of that term. And the, each of these three corresponds to one of those rules there. It's maybe easier to digest offline. Maybe I can try to finish this proof example before the usual break point, and then I can answer questions separately afterward. <coughs> All right, so we can call a tactic called intuition, which uh, because of your preparation in the theory of intuitionistic logic, you are prepared to only laugh at, at level 70% instead of 95%. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean uh, use crowdsourcing and ask people on the internet why they think it's true or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> but it means uh, simplify according to the rules of intuitionistic propositional logic, more or less. And that'll handle the structure of the ands and the ors that we were doing manually. And so we get a bunch of goals left, but they still have these ifs in them. So let's just say, look in the goal. If you see a string deck, here the x and y with question marks are patterns binding arbitrary arguments, then uh, I'll, let me give them different names to make that clearer. If you see any string deck, then do a, a destruct on that one. We're going to get to all of them eventually, so might as well destruct every one that we see. Why string deck Oh, sorry. That was a mistake. Much better. Thank you. And now we have a bunch of goals left, and some of them like this one, where this statement is both true and false, we can get rid of by calling this congruence procedure that understands equality, and that did it. <laughs> so we can see there wasn't too much to this proof after all. So let's actually take this, this uh, snippet of code and let's give it a name, a highly illustrative name like, say, T. So we can always remember it. It doesn't like that one. Oh, because, right, the induction shouldn't be in there. That will do manually. And now we can just write induction E T. So this is what would be called like a proof sketch in a mathematical paper. <laughs> and we, can, we can do that here, but it's completely rigorous. This is, this is sort of the equivalent of in a, in a paper about programming language semantics, a routine induction on E. <laughs> so, they, so here's what it means formally. <laughs> so now we can try to prove this one with the same magic. And by, I'm sure, complete coincidence, it'll turn out all right, I think. See what's going on here. And then well, it should have simplified at some point. Yeah, so what was missing here? 
was after every one of these things, let's try simplifying everywhere and doing another round of intuition. <laughs> Now we're almost done. There are just two sub goals left, and they're ha they happen to be precisely the fact that we just proved, so that's good. It'll turn out to be nice to make another version of this that's oriented in exactly the way the goal looks, so it can be pattern matched explicitly. I'll just switch the order of the equality. And this one turns out to be true by rewriting with the one we just proved. And then intuition will do the rest. So now let's re register each of these facts as a hint that should be used automatically by Koch where appropriate. I'll add both of them as hints. And now we're done. And there we go. A proof that is approximately as interesting as the theorem it establishes. <laughs> Perfect balance. <laughs> and that's the end of the lecture. Any other questions? Or maybe we should stop. Sorry? Uh, you want me to explain what the hints are? Is that, is, that, is that your question? What are hints? I'm asking you a question now. <laughs> it means whenever you're trying to prove something, look at all these hints and see if they prove it. And if they do, then use them. <laughs> it's hint for cock, yeah. Okay. It's not it's not human documentation, though it serves that purpose also, <laughs> coincidentally. Yeah. You could, but it's a little dangerous because intuition calls the hints and you can get into a loop. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So is the uh, are the hints being used by Congress? It happens to be intuition that's using the hints for this example. There are many built-in tactics that will use them in appropriate places. Yeah. Yeah, it's you. <laughs> so, so can you explain uh, the difference between a string deck and a string equal <coughs> string, string not equal string? Because I saw all of those things. Mm. String deck is a program you can run. Equality is a platonic fact that you can state. It might, or not be, might be true, it might be false, but you don't directly have a way of running it. It has a different syntax, but it uses those also. Yeah. All right. So they use intuition too. Could they use uh, intuition as well? I mean, the yeah, that's probably a decent idea. I could I could use hint rewrite with subs not free in by assumption. This is saying whenever you see it, the left hand side anywhere, rewrite it with the right hand side and discharge the side conditions by looking for assumptions that match, or using assumption. Now I think I don't even need this anymore. The one thing I'll have to change, auto rewrite with core in star. And I'll put a try because it's going to fail for the first proof because there are no hints declared yet. And then, oh, that didn't quite work. I can think about this and maybe get back to you. But in principle, this should work fine. <laughs> There aren't too many competitions for interactive theorem provers. Okay. I guess none that are only about interactive theorem provers. There are a lot of competitions for provers. For automated provers, yeah. Koch isn't going to go work too well for the standard domains of automated provers. But automated provers are often completely inapplicable to problems that Koch is good at solving. So is there a stack of work for uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah? Mm. You could. You always can, but they might just not be interesting programs. I guess this one isn't because we know equality is only inhabited by reflexivity, so here's a big complicated proof of uh, reflexivity. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yep, I'm not going to be covering that sort of thing here. I'd say there's greater than 50% chance that Bob Constable will cover it for a new Perl in his lectures. They do a lot of program extraction from proofs. In Calk, it's not so common to do that. You generally write a program and prove things about it. You can run the program, and you wrote it to be run, so it'll be fine. OK, thanks. Thank